Well, hello, everybody. Good morning, Paul. For those that have been here before, uh, it seems like one of the hurdles we always have is making sure that you can hear me. Otherwise, you're just watching my lips flap right now. So uh, if you can hear me, uh, just uh, go to the chat tab. All right, good. Awesome. Uh, And I have with me today the lovely Miss Pam, who is off camera. And she is monitoring the chat tab and the questions tab. And we are going to be talking about thermal cameras. Um, Ken says, hi, Pam. Hi, Ken. (laughs) And uh, not only are we going to be talking about the basics of thermal cameras, but I am going to be sharing with you some video from a couple of recent flights. It was a drowning flight and a missing person flight using the thermal camera and some pretty cool things that I learned. But let's get the basic stuff out of the way first here. Um, And by the way, Wayne said hello, and Wayne is teaching a class, and uh, apparently from the email that I got, Wayne, tell me if I'm wrong, that uh, you're using this for a class that you're teaching right now. Totally awesome. Love it. Perfect. Awesome. So my name is Steve Rode. I am the chief pilot of the Wake Forest Fire Department, the North Carolina Public Safety Drone Academy. Um, I am a FAA instrument rated pilot. I fly the airplane as well. And I also uh, run the website psflight.org. And I have a, uh, I think everybody here is probably uh, subscribed to it, the private email list for public safety pilots. So I have to give this disclaimer under the heading of, does anybody really know what time it is? Uh, I'm not the holder of all truth. And what you're about to hear is my experience and opinion on these subjects. uh, And I try to give you real world information, not a uh, marketing hype. So I, I want you to understand what things are like on the front line and not how, how amazing they are in a marketing publisher uh, publication. So I encourage you to always constantly learn, explore and test uh, along your journey. And most importantly, get out there and fly and test and practice and see what works best. I always reserve the right to be wrong, although I really strive not to be. So some standard housekeeping here. There's a chat tab on the right side. You can type a little message and Pam is watching that right now. If you have a a quick question or something, if you have more lengthy question or something you don't want to share uh, so everyone can see it as you're typing, there's a questions tab. There is a polls tab in there right now. There's a poll about what kind of additional classes that you'd like to see. I fully admit that I kind of slacked off during the summer and uh, enjoyed some slower time while everyone else was out doing vacations and everything else. I got to get back into developing some new classes. So your feedback is very important. Uh, And lastly, uh, there will be a link for continuing education credits. If you're a North Carolina public safety employee, you can get continuing ed credits for completing this class. There's a bunch of downloads that uh, Pam is going to post the links in the chat tab. That's why, uh, oh, 18 in class with Wayne. Awesome. Um, That's why it's important to learn where the chat tab is. And we're going to be giving you a bunch of um, PDF documents. So you can uh, open them up and whatever you do on your computer, what is that, uh, Windows, right click and save. And um, Mac is just download or something. So you can save those locally to your computer. 
I'll be showing you some videos uh, in this class, actually a couple groups of videos. And I've tried to bulk them all together so that we can go through all the slides and then we're going to watch videos and then we're going to come back and finish up with some more slides. So here's the class outline. Uh, the goal of the class is to give you information and guidance on how the thermal cameras we fly really operate and so you can configure them for your particular application. And by the end of the class, you'll have a general idea of the issues and capabilities of the cameras. And um, we'll give you a, a link to a quiz that you can take. And the important thing about the quiz is uh, you can go back around and take the test again. You have to score at least a 70% to pass the test. But once you do, you'll have a handy little certificate that you have passed this thermal class, and you can show it to whoever is important to you. Uh, there's some basic facts here. Uh, one is my screen is too damn small. <laughs> there we go. Uh, some basic facts is that the heat transfer by the release of photons is, is known as thermal radiation, infrared radiation, or electromagnetic radiation. And the thermal cameras that we use uh, actually do not measure temperature. What they actually measure is the uh, amount of photons that are hitting the plate in the back of the camera. And then the camera processes that information and makes calculations and creates an output based on the electrical resistance change on the detector in the camera. Reported temperatures um, may be off for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is the angle of the camera to the emission. Uh, another one is uh, time of day, inaccuracy of the camera, et cetera. And the result that is calibrated uh, to a temperature is presented in the image. The best way to think about the temperature that you might see uh, shown on the screen for a thermal camera is as a piece of information. Uh, I wouldn't make a decision based on something is 350 degrees. If it is climbing in temperature and it's really hot, that tells me something. But just scrolling around and looking at temperatures, not necessarily the most accurate thing. Uh, even in lower temperatures, they can be off plus or minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So the temperatures are more an indication. Probably the most important aspect to learn is that thermal cameras are not magic and they are not a solution for everything. They have significant limitations and getting the most out of your thermal camera has less to do with having a thermal camera and more to do with understanding how to configure it, how to operate it in flight, and the endless set of configurations will drive you absolutely bonkers. So here are some basic realities <clears throat> and our first uh, couple of file downloads here. Using a thermal camera seems really easy when you watch the success videos, but uh, the majority of your flights, the 95% plus of your flights, will with a thermal camera will not make the newsreel. Uh, they will not end up in that perfect successful flight. And you never see those failed videos. A hectic scene with people looking over your shoulder is not the best time to test your camera. Uh, I always find that when you first start to fly, the palettes that you will use, and we'll talk about the palettes, um, you start with the simplest one first. We all gravitate it towards it because the more complicated ones just blow your mind and you can't figure out what you're looking at. But then as you develop experience, uh, you start using different palettes and learn different things. I mean, that's exactly what I did. When I first started flying with a thermal camera, it was either white hot or black hot, and that's all I flew with. But now I'm on way the opposite end of the spectrum, and you'll see why, especially in those uh, water videos I'm going to show you. Uh, even though the cameras we fly seem automatic, there are manual changes that you can make to get the most out of them. Aeronautical decision-making is one of those things that I always talk about. The ability to make good decisions in flight to not only operate the aircraft to its peak, but also maintain safety in the national airspace and just making good decisions as a pilot. And it's that decision-making 
which when you're flying, you're trying to think about pallets and safety and wires and towers and people and everything else. Uh, that's why going out and testing. Now, what I do is when I first started flying for testing, and it worked perfectly, um, we have a local park and people go out and walk during the day and they walk at night sometimes and they walk after within civil twilight, obviously, as long as you have strobes on your drone. But you can go out to your local park with permission and um, fly and just observe people walking because that gives you targets to look at. And, you know, like one of the first things that you'll learn is that, you know, you got somebody walking in a park and they walk under a tree and they're gone. Um, and so you learn how to deal with that. So your local park, perfect test area. Yeah, get permission. Uh, <laughs> here in Wake Forest, I have a blanket permission from the the town uh, to fly in the parks. But I, you know, I got that in writing. So um, permission is important. Uh, it's easy to fall into that information overload I just talked about with all these decisions that you have to make. So keep it simple. Uh, just focus first on the basic safe flight techniques before you start worrying about all sorts of fancy things with the camera. So the objects in the open are the easiest to find with the thermal camera. It's like every video that you see out there on the news of somebody who was miraculously found with a drone is always found in an open field. Uh, it's because things that are under trees or foliage or behind structures, you, you just can't see them. And the same is true with the thermal camera. It, it can't, you know, it can't look through glass, can't look through water. Uh, there are limitations. And as much as I wish that all missing people would get lost in an open field, it just does not happen for me. Everyone gets lost in the woods or sits down under a tree or a bush or something like that. Um, and typically by the time I get called in, somebody is tired and they sat down and the thermal camera is never going to find them. I mean, the best example here of this limitation of the thermal camera with foliage. So the thermal camera cannot see through structures. A leaf is a structure. It's, it's not an x-ray device. So anytime you put something between the detector and the emitter, you're not going to get a result on the camera. So you can have the best thermal camera in the world out there, and all it takes to defeat it is a tree. Uh, all a perp has to do is stop and stand under a tree, and you can't find it. Um, so when you do see something moving in the woods, uh, then you've got to try to figure out what it is with your pallets and the way it's moving and the shape and everything else. But while thermal cameras are helpful, they're not magic. I've said that before. I can, I'm going to have to beat that into you. And thermal cameras have limitations. And let's talk about what a FLIR is. So FLIR is a, a name that we use all the time as a standard like Kleenex for tissue and things like that. But FLIR is actually a trade name of a particular company and a particular thermal camera. It's a Swedish company. Uh, in fact, if any of you know Mike Chapman, he is the public safety representative for FLIR. And that dude travels all over the world. He's, actually, he actually lives right here in Wake Forest. Uh, the first commercial use of a FLIR camera was in 1965 for power line inspections. And it had to use liquid nitrogen to cool the infrared detector. And liquid cooling is still a thing. Uh, uncooled cameras were released in 1997. And the cameras that we fly on our drones are actually, if you want to get really technical at a conference or something, they're called microbolometers. Uh, and they consist of a lens, a reflector, and a, uh, uh, a, like a film that receives the photons that are coming through this camera. So microbolometers are uncooled thermal cameras. They have specific uh, configurations. They're designed for a specific, specific type of lens, and this is why we can't exchange lenses. And they also have wavelength limitations. So right now, the cameras that we fly, DJI and other cameras, generally are have a resolution of 640 pixels, 336 pixels, or the Mavic Enterprise, which I believe is 160 pixels. And they're only able to pick up information that is in the 7.5 to 13.5 micrometer wave range. And this is why we can't see things like infrared strobes 
because they exist outside of that wave range. We also have gain on these cameras. So we have high gain and low gain. So high gain uh, covers a smaller temperature range and it's more sensitive to temperature differences while a low gain covers wider temperature range, but it's less sensitive. So uh, the cameras that we fly typically have an auto gain. And what you will see is images changing the detail that you can see in them as the gain changes. So there are times to use high and low gain, and I'll show you videos and we'll talk about that. Um, but when the image changes, you might see something in the screen that indicates the screen's changing. You'll see more detail or less detail. And that all has to do with the automatic gain that is set for your cameras. You can um, turn it on, turn it off in certain situations. I will actually uh, go to manual and leave it in a certain gain situation. Um, for example, we had a large warehouse fire and the, the thing get, just kept auto changing all the time. So I just went to a manual gain setting so that I didn't have to deal with this constant loss of detail and information I didn't need. So region of interest, often labeled as ROI in our software, talks about uh, how big of the palette that it's seen is it actually going to focus on. And ROI set to full is going to give you an even distribution of uh, radiation that's being received, thermal radiation, across the entire picture, while you can have things like 50% or sky excluded ROI. So it'll ignore the sky and allocate the remaining spectrum to uh, the, the entire spectrum to the remaining area. And I almost always fly with sky excluded to give me more detail of things on the ground. So here we're talking about wavelength earlier and the cameras that we fly are long wave infrared cameras. Here in this slide down at the bottom, we see infrared LW. So the uh, strobes that are used for infrared like military, they're down in the 0.7 to 1.3 micrometer range, which is down in the short wave infrared. I'm also going to show you a video of a um, research unit of a short wave infrared camera that the limitation of our long wave is can't see through glass, can't see through water. Short wave infrared can see through glass and can see about four feet down into the water. Really incredible. I'm not aware of any short wave infrared camera right now in the market for our drones. So here are some positive things about microbolometers. They're small, they're lightweight, they're low power. Um, they have a very long time between failure and they're less expensive than cooled detectors, liquid cooled detectors. And these detectors are typically the ones that are flown on the giant military drones, the helicopters, aircraft, uh, because they're big, heavy beasts. So there are some disadvantages of the microbolometers, and we've got three files to download here for you. Uh, microbolometers are generally less sensitive and have higher noise, um, and they're not, they don't have the world's best resolution. So on our typical thermal cameras, um, they're not sensitive to that wider range of wavelength, and wavelength matters, and they're much lower resolution. So if I'm going to show you a video and some images and you're going to get a download here for a liquid cooled thermal camera that's out there in production. And when you see the difference in the picture, um, it will blow your mind. So the best that we have is this 640 resolution, which is, it's okay. Now the problem is at night, of course, you have to fly higher to avoid obstacles. Otherwise you end up uh, wasting your battery, just trying to avoid things. So um, the higher you fly, the less resolution you get. I find that with the 336 camera and the 640, I typically fly about 300 feet at night uh, so I can cover more area and do an initial hasty thermal search. Uh, and the lower resolution, the Mavic Enterprise dual thermal camera, is really good at about 50 feet. Uh, and that's really tough to fly at night, especially if you have to fly around any trees and obstacles and stuff, you get much above that and, and it becomes more of a blur and a blob than anything else. So here are the most common FLIR palettes. Uh, you may have heard, I already mentioned the word palette. Palette is just 
how the information the camera is receiving is displayed to you. It's an artificial color uh, to help you quickly visually determine what you're seeing, what's hot and what's cold. So we have in the white hot palette, things that are the hottest are white. And in the black hot palette, guess what? They're black. And then we have all these uh, different palettes in between. Fusion is the one that you often see in marketing material because it's very pretty. Uh, and then there are other ones that are, are used uh, like rain and uh, rainbow and palettes like this. There's a reason to use all of them. So here is an example of the different palettes, white, hot, black, hot, fusion. Again, you'll recognize that from all the marketing material and uh, rainbow. So here's my concerns with these. Is it white, hot? If you're looking for the some, whatever is the hottest in the screen, um, you can see that it is the whitest, like around that car there and on the building to the left. Uh, and in the black hot, you got the same sort of thing. You got things that are really black, kind of grayish and white. But it doesn't really give you a whole bunch of nuance about what's happening there. The palette that I learned to love, initially totally hated and didn't understand it well, is the rainbow palette. And uh, the rainbow palette, palette in the lower right here gives you different information about what is the hottest. And you can see more of a, a, a sensitivity. For example, in the building to the, the right, you can see green and blue and darker blue. But in the black hot above it, it's just kind of all kind of gray. Um, so I use rainbow a lot. Thermal cameras have something called isotherms, isotherm settings. And essentially all that does is it uh, presents information in specific temperature ranges that we can set as specific colors. So it divides the spectrum of colors that we see on a colored palette, generally down to about three different ranges. So if you look on the DJI uh, software, you will see isotherm settings that say like um, search people or search fire or something like that. And you can also manually set these temperature ranges. So for search people, the lowest range is going to be a maximum of 80 degrees and then it's 80 to 89 and then it's 105 and above. And so the color scheme, as you can see here, we have color scheme one, two, and three. These are the color schemes that are assigned to those things. The rest of the temperatures below uh, 80, are going to appear some sort of black or gray or white or something like that. The whole idea is to help things stand out. And isotherm palettes, let's go back over here. So the FLIR palettes, the general ones are very kind of basic. And the isotherm palettes here, um, you can see there's lots of area that is not going to display with any color, but then the color using the different palettes is going to really stand out. So here's an example. Um, you know, when I'm looking for something with, for a very specific temperature, I oftentimes revert to white, hot or black, hot isotherms. And you can see in these images, it really helps things to stand out. Rainbow isotherm is not as helpful. Uh, neither is the fusion isotherm. So, uh, in these images here that we're looking at, I don't know what the temperature range is, but whatever is in the range that was set for these sample images is the thing that really jumps out. Uh, it looks like it's something that's fairly warm because in the white hot isotherm image, we have somebody down here who's standing in the lower right and they appear as a white target. And yet you can see the cars out there in the open uh, are much warmer. And these are actually indications that you will see using isotherms of vehicles that are either running or moving. It looks exactly like that. So even inaccurate temperatures with the thermal camera can be very helpful. This is a wildland fire and using the pointer on the camera, I can see here in the center of the screen, the temperature that it shows is 343 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see the visual image of what I'm seeing here in the lower right. So 343 degrees, uh, okay. So I know what that temperature is, but that doesn't really give me any information other than it's hot. But if you use your temperature as an indication of what is happening on the ground, they tell you a lot of difference. 
So moving and checking the temperature on one side of the fire line versus the other, 113 on the left, 82 on the right. Now I know which way the wind is blowing and which way the fire is most likely going to go. It's going to go towards the higher temperature. The heat is being blown that direction. But thermals don't just see fire. So there's this thing that I call thermal fire. You can have something that's on fire, but not visible. And in this image, what you're seeing is in the lower right, you see the thermal image of what's happening. There's really hot stuff coming out of that roof and it is uh, combustible temperatures. But at, from the visual image, you don't see anything. You don't see fire at all. So you can have, uh, we had a recent uh, townhouse row that was on fire and everything was thought to be extinguished, but there was still thermal fire going on. And using the thermal camera, you can direct firefighters into that particular area. So again, heat is not fire. In this image, it looks like there is just fire coming out of this window and it's shooting way up. It might be too small or difficult to see, but if you actually look at the picture of the house, there is nothing there that is visible. This is thermal radiation that is coming out of the house from combustion and not visible fire. Is that what you're calling thermal fire? That is what I'm calling thermal fire. <laughs> Pam wanted to know. Um, so here's how pallets can inform your view. In the white hot ISO, so this picture in the top left here, shows that um, the temperature on this roof is just barely in the, the bottom range of what the white hot ISO was. In the fusion, we see it's kind of purple and yellow. And again, it's the same sort of thing. It's just at the limits uh, of what it's set for. And then on the rainbow ISO, uh, there's more detail because I don't know, it's maybe it's just the way I look at it. But there's more definition because of the difference of the colors that are used. You can see specifically what is hotter on that roof as you go down the roof. So what's the best palette to use? Well, you know, there's a saying that the best camera in the world is the one that you have with you. And I firmly believe that the best palette that you can use is the one that you're most comfortable with at the time. Um, your preferences for palettes will change the more you use the camera. And don't be afraid to test palettes outside of your comfort zone. And this is really, this is another good thing to do in the park and practice with, not at a busy scene. So let's look at the settings and the image that are obtained here. So this is set at a white hot, um, this is 50 sky excluded, white hot isotherm. The scene is set for outdoor, isotherms are on. Gain mode is automatic in this particular case. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is the house is hot, but this is typical isotherm. The yellow part is the bottom of that isotherm range. We can see in the palette that's shown to the right of the screen. The hottest part is going to be that purplish, uh, the lightest uh, temperature that's going to alert. I'm sure this was set for structure fire. It's going to be that light yellow. And you can see the hottest part that we see right now is that window in the center of the building. Okay, now for the hardest thing, uh, finding missing people. It is the most infuriating thing to do with a thermal camera. Um, <clears throat> and I will be the first one to admit that I unfortunately have learned that there is not much difference thermally uh, between a 14-year-old girl curled up in the middle of an open field and a fresh pile of house cra uh, horse crap. Um, I did direct some deputies to a fresh pile of horse crap one night because you can't tell. It's just hot. Um, and without a whole bunch of resolution, it's difficult. We spend a lot of time guessing about what we're really looking at. So there's this uh, file six to download. Uh, DJI and a group in Europe did a study not too long ago, last year, about how effective drones are in particular types of events. And one of the things that they learned was that none of the search teams brought their thermal cameras because the weather was too warm to use the thermal. It produced too many false positives. 
And the thermal cameras are best in spring or fall. They are not awesome in summer where everything gets loaded up with thermal energy from the sun during the day, nor in the winter time where oftentimes people you might be looking for might be bundled up in coats and that uh, restricts your ability to see them. So a thermal camera is not always the magic right payload to fly. The other thing that they found, which is very interesting and the top of, of another webinar, is that the drone teams were able to locate the missing target uh, 191 seconds faster. However, they were less likely to find a target. So drone alone does not solve all the problems. A combination of a good ground team and a drone team is the best route to success. The odds are totally against you when using the thermal camera. Uh, during the summertime, like right now in North Carolina, we have a lot of trees and it's very hot during the day. And at night you go out to use the thermal camera, you're looking for somebody and you will find every deer, fox, manhole cover, uh, electrical transformer, and hopefully find the person that you're looking for. If they're sitting down or not moving, it can be next to impossible. Many objects can have the same heat signature as people. And so you have to learn to... Um, Chris says, with the right camera, ideally a cooled larger camera like an MX-15 that you have linked to winter, summer, it's still very possible that are. The ability to really fine tune your camera settings will help you succeed. Chris is absolutely right. And a cooled larger camera is going to be, the problem is resolution. Um, I had some uh, ground teams that were, we were looking for a missing Alzheimer's person. There's a target there on the ground, direct them in. They walk in, they said, we got good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is it's not the missing man. The good news is we found a goat, a horse, and a turkey. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, and so, uh, it's the resolution that's really the problem right now. So Chris is absolutely right. All right. So we got some videos to play here and you get to watch me load these videos. There we go. Invisible it's an example of long wave right through the glass. Long wave infrared. In thermal, like I said in the first video, the glass appears as just a black monolith. It's totally uniform, so it would stand out quite a bit if you're trying to hide behind it. Here's the reflective properties of glass when it comes to heat. So those reflective properties we also get on uh, water, and you'll see that reflect the the tree line out on a lake or pond. It will reflect them on the water. You'll see them. So this is an example of the shortwave infrared camera that I was talking about. And we're looking through glass windows. So the long wave, we could not see through. This is a shortwave camera in development. And you can see right through the window, right through the smoke. Another problem we have is clothing. So... Uh, there was a time I had to go out and look for some people that were uh, all dressed up hunting. And because they were appropriately dressed, the thermal camera couldn't find them at all. So th easy things like clothing can mask the thermal camera. So here's the arm. You can see it clearly. All you have to do is stick it in something. You will never find it out there in the woods or in the field. So trying to find hunters is particularly difficult. Now, here's an example of vegetation masking targets. Let me back this up just a second here. Um, what we're looking at here, this was a missing suicidal girl call. And on the ground, there's this really hot target towards the upper right. And it could be a person. It could be anything. Uh, it turned out to be an electrical transformer. But you will see the deputies walk across the road and walk under the trees and they will vanish. gone. So oftentimes what you get are these little glimpses of something moving and you've got to make a decision about what is that? 
I see a little something and it's moving. Um, you, <laughs> I have become such an expert in local wildlife. It's I, I never thought that I would have to. So here is an example of the higher, as Chris mentioned, the higher end thermal camera. This is a liquid cooled thermal camera. And I want you to watch this and look at the resolution that you're getting a thousand feet above the ground and uh, 749 feet, I think, above the ground. We will never see this uh, until technology improves on the drones that we fly. These cameras are too complicated, too heavy, and they use too much power. But, I mean, look at that resolution. So the vehicle stops. This is obviously white hot pallet. Uh, the driver gets out, starts running. You will notice even with the liquid ca a cool camera, the highest resolution, you'll still lose the person under the trees. But the glimpses that you do get, you can get more resolution. Every time I watch this, it makes me jealous. Yeah, consider with that from 50 feet, you know, with a a Mavic Enterprise Dual that what you're looking at is kind of a, a thermal blob. And yet, you know, here we are with a half million dollar camera seeing a whole lot of detail that would be totally awesome. Uh, what is the resolution of the thermal camera? Pam gave you a download on the X15 camera, for example, that has the resolution set on it. This is a thermal camera looking from miles away. Uh, I think actually this is the MX-15 camera uh, looking from miles away. Uh, and, you know, the cameras we fly, sometimes difficult for 50 feet. That was from miles away. Uh, as you can see here, the resolution is pretty good, but this is only from 45 feet up. And you get above that, it gets very difficult to see. Difference in some palettes, that's the fusion palette. This was the missing Alzheimer's patient. Okay, this is why you can't just fly low. Uh, getting closer to your subject in the dark can be helpful to see a better resolution image, but it is also entirely problematic because you have trees, power lines, um, all sorts of things down low, and it is much easier to crash your drone, have an accident with a drone. Uh, and yeah, and Chris just said that example I just showed you uh, looked to be one of the older, lower resolution ones, and the newer ones are even better resolution. It's not what we fly. So if the newer L3 uh, camera is 1080p and the Mavic camera is 160 pixels, they're completely different. Now, I'm going to show you this part of the video. This was a success video where using a drone, they said that they found the missing people or, or the perps that were running or whatever. And all you really see in the video is there's a, a dot. Uh, and it's hard to tell exactly what that dot is. We can assume that it's a person. The vegetation is not that thick. We've got open areas, and that is that is a good video. But here's another video uh, taken in the wintertime, and we have moving targets. And what you have to learn from the thermal is you have to be kind of a uh, thermal whisperer. So what we're seeing here are we're looking for two missing 11-year-old girls. Uh, are they laying down? Are they sitting down? What are they doing? But the telltale sign here is uh, that's a a fatter thing with a skinny thing <laughs> that moves. That is the head of a deer that is moving. And you just have to wait. Once things move, now you have more information. And you will notice that I believe that we'll see uh, more deer walk into the scene in the lower right here. And this is at night, obviously, because that's the visual image on the lower right. Uh, colors can be confusing. For example, in this picture. Uh, you have people that are appearing black and people that are appearing white. 
and uh, a thermal camera. So this camera was set on black hot. Um, and the reason the people are appearing black in the, the left side of the screen is because they are hotter than the underlying grass that they're standing on. But on the right side of the screen, they're cooler than the asphalt that they're standing on. All right, so now you're flying, you're looking for the perp that's running. Which of these yellow isolated thermal targets out there is the perp that the canine officer and his dog is looking for? So you're flying along and you have to make some sort of determination. Is it the stuff that's off on the top right? Is it some of these things over on the lower left? Uh, you can't see, but working with a ground team, I love working with canine teams. Um, you can isolate and find out exactly who your perp is and the dog just found the target. So this actually is the video from the, the deer, the goat and the turkey flight. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side on the bottom, I'm flying a structured search pattern looking for this missing Alzheimer's patient. And the problem is that I only have two ground team people that I can send out to look at specific targets, but yet uh, there are so many things in the woods. Now, which one of these things is a missing Alzheimer's uh, person? It's really imp impossible to see. This is an example where it's not impossible. Isotherm setting for uh, human body temperature in the wintertime where you've got less foliage cover and uh, a safe place to fly low, low. Now here's an example of that automatic gain that I was talking about. So we take off and you look at the warehouse fire here and everything you see in the fire area is all kind of washed out. Now the gain just automatically adjusted there and you can see that now the detail is showing. See the little red dot there and the, the blue cyan dot shows the camera is recalibrating itself automatically and is flipping here between low gain and high gain. And you can get much more definition out of uh, one of those palettes. Now, so here is what we're seeing, the better gain setting. We're getting more information from the structure, but comparing that white hot, let's just jump back here, comparing that white hot image that we're seeing right there with a different palette, whether it's any pa colored palette, will show you much more definition here of exactly what's going on and where the hottest spots are. So once you get comfortable using white hot and black hot, test. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. You get more information out of palettes that have a wider color spectrum than you do out of just white hot or black hot. It's just landing, I think, and showing the difference in temperature out there. The you can see the, the cool blue area where it's all kind of washed from the water. All right, in a hazmat situation, uh, you can use your thermal camera to give you more information. This is, again, in the middle of the night about what might be happening around your hazmat target. Here we have warmer temperature of something running away from this truck and the direction that it's running in. And you can obtain that with your thermal camera. And, you know, the nice thing about a hazmat is you can fly lower. We see a couple of uh, firefighters in very expensive suits walking up towards this truck. Okay, this is just uh, more comparing pallets, black hot, white hot. This is a live burn. You can see the visual image in the right-hand side, lower. And, uh, you know, house on fire. But um, watch for the difference in what you see in the pallets as we go through. So I'll let you make a decision about which palette you can see the most information in. Uh, can't stress enough, experiment, experiment, experiment. And this is uh, another example. So we can see the right-hand visual image. It's very smoky. We really can't see the roof. The advantage of thermal cameras, we can see right through that smoke and we can see what's going on. So 
So with the rainbow palette, we can actually see more detail of the heat that's coming out of the top of that structure than we could on the, uh, I think it was white hot. Isotherm settings we talked about before. We have three areas that we can break it down. So here are isotherm settings. Uh, uh, this is without isotherm. It's just regular old white hot. Now we're going to turn on uh, it's actually the ice fire pa palette. So the hottest things in the scene would appear to be red. And we turn on the isotherms. And so mid-range white hot. Yep. So mid-range white hot ISO, uh, it really targets a very specific range and it helps targets stand out greatly. Uh, so anything appears in that temperature range, you gotta have the right temperature range for the right conditions and you can help your targets to stand out. So one of my arguments about drones, especially flying on uh, residential structure fires, you don't need me in the air to tell you the building's on fire. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it's interesting, but uh, once you've done it a couple times, there's no need to fly. Flying creates risk, risk creates liability, and uh, there's not a whole bunch of information. Actually, there's no information that I can tell you that a firefighter on the ground I can't tell you or the first in engine uh, couldn't determine. The house is on fire. But it's interesting to watch the thermal energy coming out of the right side of this uh, structure. Now, angle of detection is very important. So the more direct on you are with your camera, the more photons will actually be hitting the plate in the back of the camera and give you a better image. So. The best angle for the camera appears to be more than 60 degrees. So if the camera's at 45 degrees as shown here in this example, we will look for our target and it will be harder to see. There it is, it's the canine officer and the dog walking along the path. However, watch the as the angle changes, it's gonna get more steep, more direct, and watch what happens with our image here. So we're at 52. 61. Okay, so now this is the ice fire palette. So it really helps it to stand out. But what is one of the big problems that we have with a more direct angle? Uh, you're, you're looking more and more through a straw. So at a 45 degree angle or less, you can see more of the area out there and it gives you more context and overall impression of what you're seeing. And the tighter the angle, the more direct, uh, the less you're seeing and so it is not good for just searching, looking down at a steep angle, but it does give you much more information once you locate a target you wanna pay more attention to. This is at 62 degrees and you can see the, the perp, the dog and the officer stand out much better. And that's from 400 feet high. And that's what it looked like. So you can have a thermal palette and you can change it, but really what happens is the, the camera is giving you information that the human brain has to interpret at this time. We don't have good artificial intelligence out there that will point to something and say, this is your human target. Although that technology is coming and it's in development and you know it'll be it's just time and money uh, before that actually ends up on our aircraft that we can fly. And that'll be totally awesome. I'm very happy for the day that I don't have to push up, down, right, left. And I can focus more on the information the camera is telling me. So in the lower right-hand corner, you can see it is pitch black outside, but we're still getting alerts. This is very typical in a woodland scene where you have trees that have uh, been thermal loading during the day. The sun's been shining on them and they've been uh, warming up and they're still holding heat. And then every once in a while, you come across a target here. Like there's a, a bright white target there, a couple of them. Uh, and in, those are either going to end up being sheep, I mean, uh, uh, cattle or horses, but it takes a moment to stop and you got to try to figure out, I mean, we had a missing person situation where the person went and their favorite thing was the, the horses. And, um, 
we actually found him standing next to a horse. So you cannot just rule out cattle uh, when you find it. You have to try to nitpick your way through and see if there's somebody right there. As I've said, without boots on the ground, targets are really hard to tell. This is, again, the missing Alzheimer's person search, doing a structured grid search. And we see lots of hot targets that are out there. The thing that we just passed, uh, and you see in the left side of the screen that's alerting to the ice fire palette, is water. So standing water uh, retains a lot of heat from the day, and it just totally floods your field on exactly what you're looking for. Because at nighttime, at least in early summer, late summer, um, it is oftentimes be the temperature of a human body. It becomes impossible to tell what the targets are unless you can get something that's moving. This is, okay, so this is a common situation. So you come across, you're looking for a missing person, and you come across what in the center of the screen here looks like a really good target. Uh, and unless you're looking on a somewhat big screen, like I use the Crystal Sky Large Monitor or something bigger with higher resolution that you might be feeding your image into, uh, you could easily think that this is a human body, the person that you're looking for. But there are some very discreet clues here. One is in the visual image to the right, uh, we can see that there's that bright yellow thing. So there's some sort of light down there. In the thermal image, we have the thermal target that's alerting. We're looking 90 degrees down. We're looking straight down. So we're getting the best image out of it that we can. The uh, We're flying 387 feet at this point. But you will see that black line. It's very discreet. But there's a black line that runs from that thermal target across the driveway. And this is what uh, lights look like. So street lights, um, uh, any sort of light around a driveway, uh, can look just like a person, but you have to look for the other clues. And when you're trying to maximize your search area and cover as much area as possible, um, the more you can exclude those clues, the better. So this is that hazmat situation before. And we had what we thought were three people who walked into this open scene. And so firefighters went out to try to locate them. You can see the areas where the arrows are. And Firefighters went out to try to find the people who were just gawking and uh, looking at this scene going on, and we never could find them. Uh, so I went out the next day. Here's the firefighter sent to look at the thermal target, the person standing under the tree. But the problem is that is just a really hot street light, uh, and we can't see the pole. Uh, I think I've got a picture of, and that's the storm drain that was iron and steel or whatever. And so this was the target. This is what it looked like during the day. Uh, street light, hard to differentiate between just a person. And this is the same video that I showed you before, walking towards the ground-based electrical transformer. And you, the law enforcement officers, when they're moving, you can better identify them. They're not big things with little heads that move around, but they do totally vanish under the trees. All right, now I want to show you uh, water thermal, here we go. So this is, this is a, uh, we're looking for a drowning victim. And in the lower right-hand side of the screen, you see the visual image. There are two sonar boats that are out on this lake and you can actually see the path that these slow moving boats have taken because of the difference in the water temperature behind the boats. The motors are, are agitating and changing up the surface. And I'm going to show you what it looks like on white hot and then compare it with the rainbow palette. And here we go. So this is the white hot palette, and it is very difficult to see. So if you were looking for a moving boat, in fact, since I did this, I, I use this. You'll see it in just a minute. Uh, you can see where a boat has been using a higher, uh, higher color resolution palette. 
All right, now we're going to look at them using the rainbow palette. There we go. These are the same boats. So it is easier to see. You can actually see where the boat came down across the lake, made a turn, and was heading back up the lake. And that's just the difference in temperature on the surface of the water. There you go, that's right above the boat. You can see how it's it's crossed back over its own path there. Okay, so this is uh, the following night or a couple nights later. Uh, in the middle of the night, we're looking for a missing person and in the lower hand screen, you can see it's pitch blackout. That's the visual camera there on the lower right. And on the upper left, using what I had actually discovered a couple of days earlier on that drowning call, um, I came across a small little cabin cruiser on this lake, and it's actually just going in circles. And what is even more surprising is, let me start this. This is a mystery without a solution. Okay. Now, we know that... Uh, in front of this boat, there is actually a little white target. Behind the white target, you can see the thermal difference in the water temperature. So whatever that little white target is in front of the boat is agitating, stirring up the water, and changing the water temperature. And the boat is following that around in the pitch black. I don't know if it's an animal, a person, or whatever. You can see it here. as a slow moving boat and you can see how long the, the difference in temperatures existed and you can see how it disturbed. So the most frustrating thing about that was um, that wasn't my target for the search and I could not linger around to figure out exactly what was going on. Interesting observations. So when thermals just don't work, we're on the downhill slide side. We have 12 slides to go. So bear with me. And any questions? Post them in the chat or the questions tab. So the easiest way to um, hide from a thermal camera is just put any sort of object between you and the camera and the camera won't see you. Uh, a trick used in, uh, Afga in Afghanistan um, is combatants would just take a wool blanket and wrap it around themselves and lay down. And it will temporarily provide a thermal cover until the body temperature might actually bleed through the wool blanket for after a bit, but it's an insulator. And as long as you can have some sort of separation, thermal cameras are totally useless. Uh, in the heat of the summer, there are lots of things that are hot or highly emissive. We're going to talk about emissivity, uh, one of the hardest words to say. And again, I can't stress enough without boots on the ground, thermal cameras just don't work all that well because you need people to go look at your targets okay emitted versus reflected thermal energy this is more than you ever want to know about thermal cameras but emissivity is the measure of the efficiency of the surface to emit thermal energy relative to the black body source it um so it is about how uh thermal energy you can have something that easily reflects or easily emits thermal energy and it will give you a higher uh, reading, even temperature reading, than it actually is. You can have two targets that are the same temperature, but one may appear substantially hotter in appearance to another. So again, uh, the thermal image that you see has nothing to do directly with temperature. So here are some high emissivity targets that you will run into in the real world. Rocks, boulders, animals, people, water, um, steel, soil compaction. Now you can actually find a recently dug grave using a thermal camera because the disturbed soil will be a different temperature just because of the compaction of the soil than the surrounding area. Uh, the angle that you're looking at, all of these things influence the emissivity 
of the target that you're looking at. Now, so this is reflecting energy. The more square on you are with your target, the easier it'll be to see. We talked about being shallow angle or steep angle. And this shows you if you're more than 30 degrees off axis, um, your targets can appear much brighter. So if you're less than 30 degrees, which is 70 degrees and above, then your targets will be much brighter. If you're off axis, you may not see them at all. So here's what our long wave infrared cameras can't do. We can't positively identify an object. We can't see through vegetation. We can't look through glass. We can't look through water. We can't exactly measure heat. And we don't always we don't fly the best resolution cameras around. But here's what they can do. They can give you data for the human to interpret and help make logical conclusions. They can give you some targets uh, to direct ground teams to, to look at. They can help you find somebody in the right situation. And they can be extremely helpful in moderate temperatures. Spring and fall are your thermal friend for sure. All right, so I went through a lot of information. Um, Pam just posted the link. This is, if you're a North Carolina public safety uh, person, you can fill out this form. Pam posted the link uh, for continuing education credits. And I am going to send you to take the test, give you the test link here in just a moment. And if Wayne is still out there with his 18 people, hopefully they can do a group test. Um, and uh, everyone can vote on what is the right answer. But if you need me, if you have any questions about anything drone related, this is my email address, sroad at wakeforestfire.com. Uh, never be afraid to reach out to me. And I'm always happy to help. So sroad at wakeforestfire.com. All right, here is the link to take the test. Pam is posting this now. And you go and take the test. Uh, you, the test is also an additional education tool. You may get something wrong. Uh, you'll learn what the right answer is and you'll loop back around. In fact, I'm studying for my next FAA exam and a little bit of information to go through. And it's the exact same process that, that I have to do. So before you leave, I am going to give you one more poll here to vote and publish a poll. There we go. And uh, just give me some feedback about if you learned something or not. All right. Paul says, great webinar. Well, thank you, Paul. Great student. That's all I have to say to you. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet. Go to lunch, go do something else, take the test, and uh, have an awesome day, my friends.